we can do a ton of stuff in sports analytics. You know, we have barely scratched the surface of what we can do to suss out different aspects of players' abilities, coaches' abilities, the way players work together on the field. Uh, we have barely scratched the surface in what we can find. Of course, to get the most out of those data, uh, we have to do some pretty complicated stuff. And I gave a talk last year where I said, well, we could start out by doing things like counting goals, then we can maybe count shots in soccer. Maybe we could estimate how likely a given shot is to score and give a value to a shot based on that. And oh, by the way, if I have tracking data where I can track all the players on the field and the ball and the referees, I can tell you that the players who pass the ball into the kernel of a star-shaped space based on the Barry Center of that <laughs> convex space are more likely to create scoring chances. Well, that's a really valuable insight, but how am I going to sell that to a team? <laughs> because teams have no way of judging what I can do except the fact that I have some fancy degrees. Uh, they want to understand how everything works. And the teams are run by smart people, many of whom have not finished high school. So I have to be able to explain everything that I'm doing. And so I tend to use some of the simpler things, which are still quite effective, but I need to be able to explain it to gain their trust. We can't make the leap all the way to the Barry Center in the kernel of the star-shaped space. <laughs> Dan, are you even saying that because you have to explain, you may not be able to do the analysis that you'd like to do? Is it that much of a constraint? Well, I would say that the marginal gain of going from something which is somewhat advanced but explainable to something which is very difficult to explain to someone even with a layperson's regular educational background is sometimes not worth the effort and the potential lack of trust. Mm -hmm. um, so there is an enormous amount we can do, but what we can actually implement falls short of that. And that gap is actually growing as more people with fancier tools get into this space. Definitely in my field, it's just as important to look at goodness as a fit. So, you know, about half of our effort is on individual quality and about half is on goodness of fit. If you're bringing a player from one team to another team, you need to know that they're going to slot in. And that's something that can be much more difficult to measure, but I would say it's just as important to success. We can show the areas on the field where the player is most productive. We have ways of measuring the productivity of every action that they do in terms of the likelihood of resulting in goals and points. And so we can show the areas where they're most productive, and then we can overlay those areas for all the players on the team who might be on the field together. And we're going to look for certain, if we're, we're going to look for overlaps in certain areas, and we're going to look for complementary uh, mm -hmm. zones in other areas. And, and we can do that quantitatively, not just by inspection on a heat map. Uh, and that guides us to what is sort of the best way to put together the pieces of the puzzle. You want to make sure that when information becomes universally available, like how we evaluate you, for example, that it's still useful. But you, know, you have good heart's law suggesting that as soon as a metric becomes a target, it's not a useful metric anymore. You have to find those that are incentive compatible as well. One of the big risks for people who do people analytics, which is that their products of their work will not be used correctly, and thus it will be misjudged. Right. Right? If, if, if I give you great information, but you use it badly, then you may think I'm a bad analyst.